Well, welcome to the online clinic uh, with the topic of building a skill development program. I'm John Leonzo, currently serving as an assistant coach uh, at Cedarville University. I'm going to go ahead and just walk you through kind of our approach to skill development. Uh, the very first thing uh, in regard to creating a culture of skill development, I just want to mention how important I think it is that that's a key part of your program. Really, no matter what level you're coaching at, uh, high school, college, uh, you need to make sure that you're helping your players become the, the best they can possibly be if you want to end up having the best team you possibly can have. Um, even in college where, where we can pick our own players, there's always, uh, you know, every school is different. They have academic requirements or uh, different personality requirements in regard to who can get admitted to the school. So there's always challenges in recruiting. And for that reason, uh, even for us being able to pick our own players, I think there's really nothing more important that, that we can do within our program than help our players get uh, just, just get better in their time with us. And so in order to create that culture of skill development, we really believe in just being super clear uh, about our system uh, so we know that we're teaching the right things and that we can be good at the things that happen often. Um, so that just starts with clarifying your system uh, of play and being just really concrete on both sides of the ball with how you play offensively and how you play defensively. And if you haven't done that yet and if you don't have clarity there, I'd probably say that's the very first place that you need to start. Uh, but then secondly, once you have that system clarified, in order to start building your program and create that culture of skill development, it's vital that you just go ahead and begin to define the key skills that your players need to be successful within your system. And again, I just mentioned, for us, that doesn't mean anything super fancy. It's just being good at the things that happen often. And within our system, a lot of that's attacking off the catch, at least offensively, and being able to finish at the basket. So that's what we're going to spend the majority of our time developing with our players as opposed to teaching them how to create off the dribble um, or things that wouldn't happen as often within our offense. Uh, and then once you have you know, what you're going to teach, it's then important that you figure out how you're going to teach it and try to streamline the different drills that you do and build your program up that way so that you can train in a way that's both beneficial and that the players enjoy. I'm going to kind of break down uh, what that is. So I'll go ahead and start right here just by going through just a really brief list of the things that we're going to go ahead and be teaching our players. You can see we have the various methods of attack and again a lot of that's off of the catch. We have all of our footwork with how we're going to catch the ball, how we're going to start drives and how we're going to stop drives. We have all of the different passes that we need to be able to throw and the things that we emphasize within that. Uh, the different finishes both uh, from the perimeter and from the post and then lastly protection plans and that's basically when our players end up attacking off the catch and having a drive get stalled how they can keep playing without picking up their dribble and stalling the entire offense. Um, so just to go ahead and kind of streamline this and just show you a few examples. Uh, first I'll just go ahead and show our different finishes. You can see here uh, the reach finish is the very first one that we teach with the outside hand. We use this when we've beat our defender and we have a big advantage. You're just going to put your hand under the ball, stretch your elbow away from your body, go off one leg and try to beat that defender. Uh, we also teach it using the inside hand like you can see here. And this is nice when you've cut off uh, the defender who's guarding you if you've cut off their angle of recovery. And you can reach or if there's a secondary defender that you're trying to go ahead and surprise by throwing off your rhythm, we love the inside hand. The reverse finish is no different than the reach finish. The difference is when we get our drive pushed underneath the block or if we need to go to the other side of the rim, we like to go ahead and use that reverse finish again off one leg, hand under the ball, elbow away from the body. You can see a lot of them here. And then we move into our power finishes, which are going to be off two feet, where you have a smaller advantage against your defender. You're going to come to a jump stop or a stride stop, put your shoulder into that defender's chest, and go ahead uh, and score with your body on the defender and the ball extended away. From that power stop, we then can go ahead and have a bunch of different finishes. Uh, here's the back pivot where you're going to end up stopping, turning away from the defender, and scoring on the opposite side. The step through, you're going to go ahead and show the ball, pick your outside foot up, and step by the defender. Again, these are just the ones that we teach. Um, and again, this is all off of that power finish. I'm going to power finish, then I react to where the pressure is at. And again, these are, fi these are finishes that we think all of our players need to have in order to be uh, at their most effective while we are playing. Um, the other thing we really emphasize a lot within our offense is just sharing the ball. And again here, uh, these are just a few of the different passes that we teach, but the overall idea of just being passed to where the help came from. Um, and again, I'll break down how we teach this stuff here, but you can see, you know, we're throwing the ball with our right hand, our left hand, we're throwing off of different pivots, we're sharing the ball early. Again, this is just how we play, and so it's just, you know, we want to make sure that we're teaching our girls how to actively space the floor and make passes to where their open teammates are going to be. So I, I don't need to belabor that um, and show that one really anymore. But then, you know, the third thing that we teach that's really huge for us 
is just attacking off the catch. And basically this means when you catch the ball, you're assuming that the most open that you're going to be on that possession is right when you catch it. And so with your footwork and with your thought process, you're planning to shoot first. And then everything that you do after that is just going to be a, re a reaction to not being able to shoot. So you'll see here, uh, I think in the very next clip, we're going to have a tighter closeout. And so we just ask our girls, if you don't have space to shoot it, we want you to go ahead and stop your shot and turn your shot into a drive. So you'll see that one here, start to shoot it, turn it into a drive. It just looks like a shot fake and drive. So it starts with planning to shoot. The second level that we teach is reacting to attack. Um, and again, we want our players making these decisions within one second. So again, this is just to provide you some context of what we teach um, and how we want to play. And again, here you can see like we don't hold the ball, we don't over dribble it. A lot of our attacks are right off the catch as often as we can make it be that way. Um, so again, it's just a really small sampling of how we play um, and again, how like our system is streamlined in order to help our players uh, make just, just be the best player that, that they can go ahead and be on the floor. So that's, that's the what we teach. Now I'm going to go ahead and dive into the how. Um, how we teach things. Well, the, I think the thing that's different about our skill work than most people's is we are really big on joining decision making with technique. Um, and I believe that technique and uh, decision making are what makes up skill. They don't exist independent of one another. So I heard one time that there's three parts of skill and this really resonated with me. Um, reading, planning, and doing. And so this is why we teach decision making because on every single skill, uh, most times when we think player development, we just focus on the doing, the actual technique or performing the actual rep. Um, but with every skill in a basketball game, what you're going to end up having a good chunk of is having to read the situation and then plan to execute the skill before you actually get to the doing part of it. Um, so the example I'll give you is like shooting from a spot in practice. Think about making five spots from five shots from the same spot. Uh, on the very first rep, the player has to go ahead and uh, you know make the decision to shoot to read if they're open or not. They have to plan how hard to shoot, and then the last part is the actual doing or execution. And then on their second shot, third shot, fourth shot, and fifth shot, they actually only have to do the doing part. And so you're not getting the full skill loop. Uh, as a result of that drill. So again, when, when you join decision making with skill work, you end up letting the player go through that whole entire process and really do the best they can uh, and, and, and kind of make your time the most effective with your skill development. And so we do that through a teaching method that we call TLC and that just stands for teaching, learning, and competing. And it's just kind of how we go ahead and progress through skills. So the T uh, stands for a teaching drill and that's where we always start with our player development. It's figuring out what skill are we going to teach, what are the key teaching points for that skill, and then um, you know, lastly the question you have to ask when you're starting with this model is what decisions does the player have to be good at in order to use that skill in a game. Um, so what are you going to teach? Let's just use the example of finishing. Uh, we'll talk about those reach finishes. Uh, the key teaching points are going to be having your hand under the ball, extending your elbow away from your body, and scoring off one leg while your eyes are facing the rim and staying on the rim. So that's the teaching points. And the decisions the player has to be able to make is knowing when they have a big advantage by their defender um, or if they don't. We don't want to play off one leg when there's a lot of contact or a limited space. We want to use our one foot finishes when we have we ha when we have space to use rather than space that we need to create. So that would be kind of the context and the decision making. And so I kind of have that here in the flow chart just with finishing. The very first decision the player has to make around the rim is should I finish or should I pass? If they choose to finish, they have to figure out how to finish. And again, that's do I have space to use or do I need to create space for myself? Um, if they decide to pass, they have to figure out what pass to throw or where to throw that ball. And that's just deciding between like who helped or if they're stuck using a protection plan. So again, there's so many decisions getting made just in the realm of finishing that to just teach the technique of finishing really is incomplete. So we would start teaching finishes through a teaching drill. And again, that's just working on the technique of that skill at a slow pace. We're giving them the giving them those cues I just mentioned um, and I'm just kind of watching the player go ahead and execute that and as soon as I feel like they have a basic level of competency with that skill we're gonna move on and start to add decision making and so what I would encourage coaches to do is to use these teaching drills as their warm-up drills just because the player can go ahead and get warm they can get loose they can get confident and they can have that reminder of the technique that we're trying to go ahead and achieve so here would be an example of one of our teaching drills from a player development workout where we're actually working on reach finishes. Um, so again, we're just kind of going through 
asking the girls to really pay attention to the technique of how they catch the ball. So you're going to see their feet in the air, stepping into triple threat, and then driving the ball, going off one leg, eyes on the rim, hand under the ball, elbow away from the body, going through all of our progressions there and just getting warm. Coaches can walk around, check for technique. And again, we're not doing this for very long just to go ahead and get warm. Once you are ready to move past that, the L in TLC stands for a learning drill, and that's where you're going to go ahead and add in decision making and basically create a drill where players have to make decisions freely, but uh, the design of the drill is such that you're going to encourage using the skill that you're focusing on. And so we usually do that um, by giving the player two choices in a drill. So say we're going to finish or work, work on those reach finishes, um, we would tell the player, um, you know, if you can't score with a reach finish, keep your dribble alive and kick the ball back out to me. Or if you can't score with a reach finish, uh, turn your dribble into a post up and play from there. And again, you're just helping guide their decision making in a live type setting. And so this is almost always a drill where the offensive player has an advantage. And there's two types that you can do there. You can uh, set a drill up so that the defender dictates how big the advantage is that the offense has. Or you can set a drill up where you as the coach can dictate how big that advantage is. And as the players are going through this learning drill, they're competing, they're playing, they're making decisions. I think the best way to coach those drills is through questioning rather than through direction. Um, so it's a lot of times of asking, what did you see? What made you do X, Y, or Z? Who stopped you drive? Why did you throw that pass? And just letting the players be a little more engaged in the learning process versus you just telling them everything that they have to do and them depending on you. So I'm going to go ahead and show you now some of our different learning drills. Um, and again, the first two are going to be where the player is dictating how big the advantage is. I'm sure a lot of you guys have probably seen this before, but this is just, we call it blind one-on-one. -on -one. And this would be a game that we use when we're trying to work on our one-leg finishes. We're giving the offense a big advantage because of the setup of the drill. Um, so here, the defender is putting their heels on the three-point line with their chest facing the rim. The offense is putting the back on the the ball rather on the back of the defender and as soon as the offense takes the ball off the defender's back it's live one-on-one -on -one going to the rim now the offense has a big advantage here because they're the one dictating when the drill starts um, and again because it's a big advantage type finish hopefully we're going to be scoring off of one leg using one of our reach finishes or reverse finishes um, a player is not wrong to play off two feet here but again, if that does happen, we want to talk about why it's happening and help them make better decisions on the floor. The other thing that we're really working on here with this drill is for our uh, driver to veer back in the, into the defender and cut off their angle of recovery. And this is really big for us when we drive the ball either off the catch or in pick and roll uh, as there's a defender trailing us to get in the way of them trying to go ahead and recover. And that just simply means trying to go ahead and take your first dribble uh, both to the rim and to get inside that defensive player. And you can see here a lot of our girls are doing it. And when they do, they get easy shots. Uh, when they don't, they take a much tougher shot. So this is blind one-on-one. -on -one, and again, it's a drill that we would use where the player uh, dictates the advantage and they you know just the drills really encouraging them to use a lot of those reach type finishes um, the second one that we'll go ahead and work through is hip one-on-one -on -one, and this is a drill where the offensive advantage is smaller because of where the defender starts and we would use this if the skill focus for the workout was our power finishing series which is like again a power finish which is just a two foot landing shoulder to the chest of the defender um, chest to the baseline where my body's on the defense and the ball is away if the defender eats up my space, I'd shot fake and step through. Um, if the defender is giving me space and I can't step into them, I would go ahead and back pivot away from them. And so how hip one-on-one -on -one works is there's going to be a defender on the, uh, you can either put them on the inside or outside of the uh, offensive player. Here we have them on the inside because we're trying to drive down the rail. Um, the offensive player can either go off the catch or off stationary dribbles, but again, play is live whenever the offense decides to start to drive the ball here. And because of just the positioning of the defensive player here, it's going to be a smaller advantage at the rim. So we're working on playing off two feet and creating space rather than using space around the basket. Um, here you can see if a player does really get a good beat on their primary defender and they do get a big advantage, they're just going to go ahead and score off one leg carrying over uh, our previous workout into the next one and again here you can see that we're coaching as they go um, but again just kind of keep an eye on the players here and watch their decision making of when they need to play off two feet because it's a small advantage and they need to play with power um, or if they can go ahead and beat their defender clear out and score with a reach finish like that one did right there so again there's decision making being added into it each drill and activity and practice is building off the next one 
And again, we're working on just how we finish at the rim because that's such a vital part to our offense. It's going to be messy. There's going to be a ton of mistakes, um, and that's okay. I feel like that's where the learning occurs. Um, if the players are just executing everything with precision, uh, we're probably not getting better because we're already doing things that we know how to do. So there has to be some level of struggle involved. I mean, again, I think this is a good way you can do it because the drill is set up to give the offensive player success while also having an appropriate amount of challenge uh, so that they can continue to get better and work on the skills that we're trying to go ahead and teach them. And again, here you can just kind of observe our coaching. We're bouncing around here, giving different, uh, you know, encouragements and corrections here as needed um, and again it's just I think an effective way like practice is flowing we're not talking the whole time the players are getting better you can maximize the time that you have on task um, and again they're just able to go ahead and practice in a environment that more easily mimics the game um, now the downside to using some of those drills that are player directed is sometimes if you have a really good athlete uh, versus maybe a less uh, quick athlete the advantage, no matter how you set up the drill, isn't going to be what you want it to be. So sometimes in practice, we like to use advantages where the coach directs how large it's going to be. That way I can kind of compensate um, either for a, a difference in athletic ability between two players or I can more easily create the situation that I want that player to make decisions in. So um, this is a drill that we call back tap, uh, and I do it here two on two, but we would start with it one on one. Basically, the offense is on the baseline facing a uh, coach at the three-point line. The defender of that player is by the coach. The offense is going to dribble around the coach, and as soon as I tap the back of the defender, it's live one-on-one -on -one to the rim. And so, again, here, I like this drill because I can dictate how big the advantage is going to be for our player driving the basketball. Um, so, for example, here, if we had a player that I think needed to be better making decisions uh, when pressured, I would go ahead and give them a smaller advantage by tapping the back of the defender earlier. If it's a player that I think needs to work on finishing fast, I'd give them a bigger advantage. And I can kind of tailor that because I know what they need to work on and I'm involved in the drill. And I don't even have to take the time to tell all the players what they have to work on. I can just kind of manipulate the environment and make sure that we're moving pretty quick here. Um, again, we're doing it out of two on two. This is like an offensive breakdown drill for us almost. Uh, our system Again, because it's clarified and defined and our skills are such a vital part of it, uh, we're able to work on both our system and our skills at the same time. Um, and so here again, you can just see out of two on two how we're adding in a little another layer of decision making with if I can't get downhill playing a two man game or, or whatever it may be. And again, I'll get into later how to load into drills, but even for finishing just this back tap is a really good way to play one on one and kind of the coach dictate the environment. Uh, another way that you can do that. And this is one I really like as well. Uh, we just call it hand touch. And again, you can play it one-on-one. -on -one. Um, here we're doing it in two-on-two, -two, and I'll, I'll talk you through the, the points of the two-on-two -two game later. But basically, the offense and defense are on the baseline, and they're going to throw the ball out to me. And based on what I do with the ball dictates whether the offense is driving middle or whether they're going to drive at baseline. So if I put the ball in my inside hand like I'm doing here, the offensive player and defensive player curl around, around my back and the offensive player has to be first. So this is going to give a really big advantage to the offensive player, and that's if I put the ball in my inside hand. So here the ball's kicked out, inside hand, defense has to trail, offense has a big advantage and scores with a reach finish at the rim. You'll see here a little bit later, uh, I end up putting the ball in my outside hand, and when I do that, when I put the ball in my outside hand, the offensive player grabs it and drives baseline, and the defender has to touch my inside hand before recovering. And again, I can kind of dictate, based on where I put my hand, um, how big the advantage is going to be for the offensive player. So I think this next one we end up getting into uh, the grab and go. So now the ball's in my outside hand. It's a baseline drive. The defender has to touch my inside hand. And again, based on where I put that hand, I can dictate how big the advantage is. And that helps me. I can match players up easier. I can create harder situations for players that are maybe more advanced, easier situations for players that need to keep refining their skills. I mean, it just lets you as the coach, again, really efficiently kind of control the drill and facilitate learning in a really positive way. So again, you can kind of work on, this would be a drill that we would use after we've taught all of our finishes, we've done our different hip one-on-ones, blind one-on-ones. Um, now we'd go ahead and use that one so they can make those decisions freely and interchange uh, between the two. So again, that's just another example of a coach-directed advantage drill. And those are some of the learning drills that we use. And then once the learning drill is done, um, we then move into competing. 
and competing is exactly what it sounds like. You're just using the skill in a live setting. The coach isn't really stopping it. Um, it's you know no longer having a huge offensive advantage um, where the player is being encouraged to use the skill. It's just a live setting of play. Um, so here, a competing drill that we would use for finishing uh, is just two pass one on one where the defender starts under the basket, throws it to a passer at the top of the key. The passer swings it to the offensive player and play is live on the catch. So now the player catching the ball can shoot it if they would like to. They can react to a hard closeout by driving it. If they have a big advantage at the rim, they can go ahead and use a reach finish. If they have a smaller advantage at the rim, they can go ahead and use one of the power finishes. Uh, additionally, we sometimes let the players, if they get stuck, because we don't want to take bad shots or tough shots, kick it back out to the passer, recut, and play one more series of one-on-one. -on -one. That's an option you can do. Um, and again, you can load these drills up to two-on-two -two to three-on-three. -three. It's pretty versatile right there. Um, but again, you're just you're progressing in a way where players are getting to make decisions. They're training in a context that looks like the game. Um, and there's a really logical flow to how you're loading the drills in and progressing versus just rolling the ball out. I think a lot of times using games to teach or a games-based approach um, or live training gets a really bad rap because players or critics would just critics of that teaching method would just say, well, you're just rolling the ball out there. You're not actually teaching. Um, but again, following this progression method, it allows you to teach alongside and use these games as a tool. So again, we want to train this way, um, number one, because I feel like it most mimics the game and because players are making decisions. Um, number two, it has just a really high level of transfer. You can see here the different finishes from practice to a game um, are almost identical. So here we're driving the ball, defender on our back, reach finish. Um, again, this next clip, it's going to be off of a ball screen, defender trailing and on our back, reach finish. And so again, you're able to kind of break down the end of the possession and train in a way that's going to actually mimic the game environment so the player's reps are a little more beneficial. And I think they also enjoy that competition in it. So it's just a really small example of a game transfer. I have a much longer video showing some different things that we do and how they transfer. Um, so again, as I just mentioned there, I think this is a really beneficial way to, 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 to train, um, but decision-making games or small-sided games, they're, they're not the end-all be-all of coaching. Uh, they're just tools that you can use, and it's, it's really up to you to use them well. Um, and so, again, I think sequencing, how you're going to teach, what leads into what is where the magic is, and these games simply serve as a means to help you and, and kind of guide you. Um, so, big believer, um, I heard one time that practice should read like a book meaning there should be a logical flow to it, chapter one to chapter two to chapter three to chapter four. Um, you know, and again, that would be like finishing, leading to drive and score or drive and pass, and then that kick out leading to another decision, and just a really logical flow to how you're teaching things. Um, it's also important to note that like players learning isn't always linear. It's not always gonna be a smooth progression of chapter one to chapter two to chapter three to chapter four. You might get to chapter one, move to chapter two, get to chapter three, and then realize I got to go back to chapter one because I, I moved on too quick. And again, that's okay because you already have that flow to it. You already have that plan built out. Um, and then in addition, I think for each practice session, quote unquote, reading like a book, also vital uh, that from one practice to the next practice, there's also a really logical flow there. And so um, kind of what dictates how we teach our offensive side of the ball in regard to our player skills is basically working from the inside out or from uh, the end of a possession to the start of the possession. So again, for us, we want to start with our players getting really good at how to use an advantage once they have one, and then we'll go ahead and work backwards and eventually learn how to create those advantages ourselves. And so what that looks like for us, uh, teaching offense in reverse, quote unquote, is starting with finishing at the, at the point of attack, at the very end of the play, how are we going to score? Um, and then once we're learning how to do that, then we're working on the decision making of should I finish or should I pass? And so when we're going to go ahead and start talking about passing now uh, out of a kick out, we have to start working on how we're going to space uh, when the ball is being driven. And then the different types of pivots and passes we need to go ahead and find those players who are spacing accordingly. And then the next part is once that ball has been kicked out and a perimeter player is catching it, they then have to get really good at learning the technique of how we want to catch the ball, what our shooting footwork looks like, and then how to make that decision, should I shoot, should I drive, or should I swing it, ultimately probably ending in another chance to finish at the rim or kick the ball out and then attack off the catch. So it's just kind of one big cycle that just keeps turning itself over, and I'm a big believer in teaching it in reverse there. So what that looks like practically is that the drills I just showed you 
that we're going to use for teaching finishing one-on-one, -on -one, um, we eventually start to load in two-on-two, three-on-three, and four-on-four, and et cetera. In addition to that, you can kind of load in, um, you know, you could go two-on-one -on -one with two offensive players versus one defender. You can be creative with, with how you go ahead and do that. But again, I just mentioned we're going to move from uh, deciding what type of finish should I use or how should I finish to then should I finish or should I pass. And that can be done with a low post player um, who you could pass to. It can be done with a perimeter player, completely up to you. Um, and again, then once, once you are kicking the ball out to that player on the perimeter, then you're working on the decision of should I shoot it, should I drive it, should I swing it. Um, so I'll go ahead and just show what that looks like here a little bit from drill to drill. All right, so this is going to be an example of a perimeter load into a one-on-one -on -one drill. So again, I just showed this one. Um, but now here with this drill, we're not just worried about our player finishing at the basket and whether they should use a, you know, a fast finish off one leg versus a power finish off two legs. But we're also working now on how we space according to drives. And that would be a, like spacing is a skill for us. Um, so our general rule is if the ball's being dribbled at you, you push away. If the ball's being driven away from you, you feel behind. And so now, based on where I put the ball and based on where the player drives, our off-ball player now has to react to that. So it comes middle, we push away, that creates a long closeout for the next defender, and we're able to go ahead and take a big three. Um, now, in two-on-two, -two, it's important to note, you kind of have to define parameters here. So sometimes we'll have a coach stand here in the corner so this player doesn't fade all the way into the space that another player is going to go ahead and occupy. Um, and again, you can make different rules too where you, like for us, a lot of times we make them catch the ball outside the three-point line just because we want to have great spacing. Um, now when the ball is being driven away from them, you can see our girls filling behind and working to be that fill. And again, this is just not just training how we score at the rim, but also our penetration reaction rules and working on spacing so we know where, where we're going to go with the ball. Um, talking about different passes that we would go ahead and teach, um, let me go to this here if it, if it loads where we're driving middle and uh, you know if you're going to kick the ball out to a player in front of you, we would call that a pitch where you're going to you know be driving the ball, you're on the move, you're on the run, and you're just throwing the ball off the dribble with probably one hand um, pick up to get it out there nice and quick. Um, and throw it in a straight line. So that would be one of the passes we'd be teaching and training here. Um, when we end up playing with the fill, that's almost always going to be off of a jump stop where we pivot away from the defender and then throw the ball to them, filling behind with our outside hand. I'm not sure if I have any fills where we're actually passing the ball in this drill. Um, we'll go ahead and let it run here for a second just so I can see. Um, so that would be an example where we don't make the right cut and again, they play through it, we figure it out, and then they'll get coached on it after that possession ends. Um, so here you go, that's a good example. We come to a two-foot stop, we play with the fill, and play continues to go on. Um, so again, players are able to go ahead and learn the different types of passes that we want as well uh, through these different drills. The other way that you can start to load your two-on-two -two drills, um, this is probably where I would start actually, is going to be with an inside player. So for us, we play uh, four guards, one post player. So another big decision we make when we drive is did the center's defender help and I kick the ball off or did they stay and I go score? And you can do this from blind one-on-one. -on -one. You can do it from hip one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you can take X1 out and just have one drive and play two-on-one -on -one with X5 being the only defender. Uh, com again, completely up to you, but that would be an example of an inside load. So then once we've done two on two, uh, we then build up to three on three. And this will be an example, just one of our dribble drive breakdown drills where we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna play hip one on one. Um, and this time we're gonna have an inside player and a perimeter player filling behind. So this corner is filled here. This player is gonna be looping underneath the rim, one of our rules here. And so again, you can see it's that same hip start that we were playing one on one out of, now into three on three. And we're not just working on finishing, but passing to where the help came from. And then for our perimeter players as well, catching the shoot or reacting to attack based on that closeout that the defense gives. Um, so again, this is just a breakdown drill for us and we're working on our offense and our skills at the same time. And again, that's why I think it's really clear that you need to clarify your system um, so that you're not wasting time by doing things that aren't going to happen in a game, but you're working on basic, simple skills um, so, you're, so that the girls or, or boys that you coach can make simple plays time and time again in a possession and everybody's on the same page skill-wise. So this is another way you can start it, um, where the defender is on the inside of the offense and can't go until a catch is made by the offense. And again here, if, if the advantage isn't quite where you want it, you can move the defender even behind the offensive player. That's up to you. But again here, a lot of this is just working on 
um, driving to score, passing to where the help came from, catching to shoot, reacting to attack. Um, so again, it's, for us, it's finishing, it's passing, it's attacking off the catch. It's all of our basic skills getting used. I'd mentioned earlier um, about protection plans that we teach our players. One of them is this right here. And that's basically to turn your drive into a post up. So if you're driving and you lose your advantage, to keep your dribble alive, flip your hips uh, to go ahead and post up. And then from here, our player who's supposed to fill can read their defender to if the defender digs and helps on the post up, we'll get a three. If we fill and we're bothered, we'll go ahead and get a cut to the rim. That's what we get here. And again, we're able to go ahead and make a play. So now we're using our protection plans as well. And all of that just, again, builds on top of it. So that would be an example of how we develop skill uh, building up into three on three. And then lastly, the next progression would be four on four. And again, you could do a, the drill I just showed you, um, playing four on four by putting another player on, on the perimeter. Uh, another one that we do a lot, this is just called four on three shooting. And this is just with our perimeter players during our like positional breakdown time. Um, but there's three players on defense, four players on offense. The coach throws the ball out to an offensive player. And our rule is either the first or second player has to drive the ball. As they drive it, they're trying to go ahead and shoot a layup. If they're stopped, they're going to pass to where the help came from. Their teammates are going to react to where the ball is being driven from. So if it's being driven at them, they're going to go ahead and push away. If it's going away from them, they're, they're going to go ahead and fill behind. And now when the ball is kicked out, we're working on the decision of should I shoot it? Should I swing it? Should I drive it? And again, all that comes down to how we're catching the ball. You can see our girls with how they're catching with their footwork. Um, almost always ready to shoot the ball, feet are in the air, stepping in to get the triple threat. Everything that we teach is being incorporated into these drills. So again, are, are we working on our offense right now? Absolutely. Are we doing player development right now? Absolutely. And because our system is clarified um, and streamlined, we're able to go ahead and save practice time by doing both. And so again here, just a really good way for us um, to kind of teach both at the same time and again, keep giving advantages um, and learning how to play with one. So that's kind of our framework of how we go ahead and do skill development. Again, it's that TLC model of teaching, learning, and competing. We're going to go ahead and pick one skill to work on per workout. We're going to teach that skill. We're going to work on learning it through advantage or decision-making games. Then we're, going to get a, then we're going to go ahead and compete live. Um, and again, that can be done in four-man workouts, um, playing two-on-two. -two. It can be done as part of your practice by breaking out positionally. Um, it can be done by having multiple positions playing together on two different ends in your practice. You can be creative with how you're going to go ahead and use it. But again, I think it's really important to have that clarity of what your system is, what skills are needed to be good at it, and then how you're going to go ahead and teach them every single day. Um, so obviously, if you have any questions or would like to get um, some notes that go along with this presentation, please shoot me an email at jleonzo at cedarville.edu. Um, obviously, if you're here in the state of Ohio and you'd love to come watch us practice, we would be honored to have you. You're welcome anytime. Uh, just shoot me an email there as well, and you are always welcome. So thanks for your time. Thanks for paying attention, and I hope that you were able to take away something uh, that was beneficial.